Hey, everybody out there. Once again, Paul Craig Roberts with us to talk about something of great import to what you own or what you think you own. And Paul has been digesting a, a, an important work by uh, an author that is going to be holding up to the screen right now by uh, David Rogers Webb, talking about, which is uh, called The Great Taking. And we're about to explain what that's all about. Now, this seems to be corresponding, Paul, to all the talk, uh, I guess, from Klaus uh, Schwab about the Great Reset uh, that the World Economic Forum has been talking about preparing for us. And what it means essentially is you will own nothing and be happy. Could this actually be happening, Paul? Could it be possible? I, I Apparently, yes. Um, uh, David Rogers Webb is a um, hedge fund manager for many years. He's, you know, a professional in the financial industry. And he started noticing things. Of course, his colleagues are mainly concerned with making money. <laughs> and uh, don't ever get into anything any further than that. But uh, Mr. Webb apparently began noticing various uh, regulations that were very curious and, uh, and seemed to be undermining people's claims to their own assets. At the last year, he, um, after trying to get people interested, he gave talks around to various financial groups and he sat down and, and wrote a book, and this is what it looks like. Um, and it's actually a very thin book. Uh, there's actually 30 pages of text explaining what has happened and the regulatory changes that uh, brought it into effect. Uh, there's also a relatively long introduction, roughly 25, 30 pages, that is about him and his experience and so on and and uh, his comparison of the present situation with the uh, great depression when banks failed and people lost their money and then <clears throat> so and then there's 20 pages at the end which is the federal reserve bank of new york's response to the European community's inquiry about uh, what this means for people's property rights and their assets. And, the, and it's as clear as day, the Fed tells them they don't have any. <laughs> so, so um, and this book is available uh, free online. Um, and uh, the link to it is in my first article about it on my website, um, The Great Dispossession, Part One. Uh, you can also buy it, as I did, uh, a print copy for about $10. Uh, I find a print copy easier to work with. Uh, the book is uh, it's readable, but it's not well organized and so i went through it and and separated out the parts so you could see what's happened and then you can see the regulatory changes that caused it and then in the third part you can uh, i i give an account of what he says about why the crisis is going to happen that and we're actually close to it and um to try to uh, spread the word, try to get people aware, and <clears throat> not that people can't do anything about it, but it is uh, possible. You see, you have to understand this affects everybody, from the little guy to the mega billionaire. Well, Paul, talking about the little guy, uh, I'm a little guy, like millions of Americans, I assume that when I put money into the bank, if the bank is in trouble, if it fails, my savings, my deposits will be covered by the FDIC, which was instituted after the failure of the banks in 29. That, so my deposits are safe. If the bank is in trouble, federal government, federal deposit insurance company corporation will come in and cover my deposits. You're saying that's no longer so. Um. Probably not. Uh, there are two reasons. 
one reason certainly it's you're not covered and that is the FDIC uh, has a fund of about a hundred billion dollars but the insured deposits are seven trillion so you know you might get a few cents on a dollar if they treat it on a pro rata basis but it's the FDIC simply hasn't got the funds to make the insurance good. It's based on the notion that only a few banks fail. Right. And um, so, but that's not what we face. So that's one reason uh, you're not insured. And you remember now the whole purpose of the of these regulations that have produced this new ownership system is to avoid bailouts by the central bank. You're now to have a bail-in, which means our assets bail out the creditors, not the Fed creating quantitative easing. So what is the second reason that I don't think the FDIC uh, is really there. Now, they have not passed any law eliminating the FDIC. But as I read the account by David uh, Rogers Webb, all bank assets are pooled in the same pool. I mean, all bank deposits are pooled in the same national pool. And in that pool are the secured deposits. Oh, I'm sorry, the insured deposits. So the insured, the FDIC deposits are in the same pool as all other non-insured. Remember now, you're insured up to a quarter of a million dollars. Anything over that, you're not insured. And so what people do, they put quarter million in this bank, quarter million in that, quarter million in this. But <clears throat> nevertheless, everything is pooled in a national pool. And this has happened to every Western country. So the United States, Canada, Germany, France, everyone has the deposits in their banks pooled in a national pool. And then all of these national pools are connected to the international pool so that creditors anywhere in the world have instantaneous claim on your assets if the financial intermediary holding your financial assets gets in financial trouble and is bankrupt, whether it's Merrill Lynch or Schwab or Wells Fargo uh, the pooling of all bank deposits in a central pool and the connection of all national central pools to the international pool makes, makes it possible to transfer our assets instantaneously to the creditors of the failed institutions. How are they, so, getting, how are they getting away with this, Paul? Uh, well, it's it's not uh, it's not been done legislatively, so people don't know about it. It's been done uh, with regulations. You have to remember one of the worst results of the Great Depression, which lasted the decade of the '30s. Uh, um, was the creation of regulatory agencies. And these regulatory agencies essentially uh, appropriate the legislative powers of the Congress. For these regulatory agencies, when Congress passed the law, it dotted every I, crossed every T, and Congress controlled the meaning of the law in its implementation. So 
The law was implemented by Congress as well as written, and so it reflected the intent of Congress. Now, during the 30s, uh, and Roosevelt's brain, brain trust, a lot of arrogant intellectuals who uh, uh, demeaned Congress, uh, they gave the regulatory agencies the power to implement the law by how they wrote the regulations. Yeah. So an act of Congress became an authorization for some regulatory agency to write the law. So it's no longer Congress, it was an agency that were... Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and uh, over time, the courts gave deference to the regulatory authorities over the Congress. And I can give you an example of this. The 1964 Civil Rights Act explicitly prohibits racial quotas. It's written there, it's firm, it's explicit. Well, the minute the EEOC, which was the regulatory agency the, for this, this law, got it, the regulatory bureaucrat, uh, Bloomrosen was his name, imposed affirmative action, which is their word for racial quotas. They gave preference to blacks in university admissions, employment, promotions, and these were called, this was called affirmative action. And so he created a quota regime, but it stood, even though it was prohibited by the law he was using. <laughs> So that's just one example. So basically, uh, the Congress doesn't really control the laws. The regulatory agencies control them by how they interpret Congress and how they make the regulations. And the courts defer to the regulatory authority. Okay, now the Great Reset, Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum, are they in charge of this? Are they the ones that have designed this and are implementing this by nefarious means? I mean, I who's, who, whose project is this? It's a project of, well, that's that's the question. It's been done by regulatory authorities silently out of the public eye and apparently not noticed uh, by Congress. And apparently not noticed even by the financial community. I mean, other than David Rogers Webb. <laughs> so, um, but yes, it it looked. It, you see, the W the World Economic Forum. It's fifty years old. It's been working fifty years, organizing support, and now it has most government leaders in the West. Uh, most most important uh, corporate CEOs, uh, uh, lawyers, intellectuals, um, in the business, uh, government, social world. If you're not a WEF member and you don't go to Davos, uh, you're lower down on the totem pole. It's become a status symbol, and. It's also a uh, uh, indication that you are on the path of success. You were invited once. <laughs> I, I was invited once. I attended with my colleagues at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Henry Kissinger, Brzezinski, uh, Schlesinger, James R. Schlesinger, Secretary of Defense, head of the CIA, uh, uh, the four of us were invited. Uh, I don't know if they joined or not. Uh, um, I couldn't tell exactly what was going on. It, it, is, it seemed like just another uh, somebody on the mate building an organization. 
<laughs> using names of people of accomplishment or um and it didn't dawn on me at the time that uh, there was some sort of a organized agenda uh, to take away our property rights. But that's what Klaus means when he says, you will own nothing. And be happy. And, and be happy. But that's not the important part. You will own nothing. Well, what uh, Webb's book, The Great Taking, shows is that the regulatory process is now complete. And if there is another uh, financial crisis, like in what, what was it, 07, 08? 08. You, we will own nothing. Oh, you know, Paul. Time, see, it, you have to remember, Larry, at that time, the central bank came in and created the money, trillions and trillions, right. to bail out the system. And the central bank's balance sheet went from like 800, 900 mil, uh, billion to four or five trillion dollars. And it was creating money to buy the troubled assets so the banks wouldn't fail. Right. Well, you might remember that uh, the media or the powers that be, somebody whipped up a lot of public opposition to bailing out the banks. Hmm. And so that's what they wanted. They wanted the public to be against it because they said, okay, no more. Next time it's a bail-in. With your money. <laughs> well, the people didn't understand that. They thought it meant the bank's money. The yeah. banks would have to pay. That, that's what the people wanted, the banks to pay. They didn't realize banks didn't have any money to pay with. And a bail, what a bail-in means is your deposits at the bank are used to bail out the bank's creditors. That's how the bank is bailed out, that its creditors are paid off with our money. Now, I knew this was true about bank deposits. This came to the fore some years ago when Cyprus and Greece got into financial trouble and people could not get their money out of the banks. Uh, then it became somebody then made it clear that, look, this is just the beginning. The new system, you don't, you won't have control over your deposits. They belong to the creditors of the bank. So enough people have been aware of that, that they reasoned, okay, look, we're going to put our money in the banks too big to fail. So, you know, the five big banks have about 90% of the deposits of the banking system in the United States. Huh. And because people believe they won't let those banks fail so they won't lose their money. And what they don't know is that the Fed, according to David Rogers Webb, allows these banks to create subsidiaries and they have they can create a subsidiary into which they put our deposits. Hmm. And then the Fed lets them put in the same subsidiary all of its troubled derivatives. So the subsidiaries can fail, but not the bank. And so, no, your money's not any safer in the big banks, according to Webb. Now, Larry, uh, to get over this. So far, we're talking about bank, your bank deposits. Well, what I didn't know, and no one knew, and I learned from this book, all of these regulations over these years, it's been going on for like 20 years, maybe longer, you know, step by step by step. They've done the same thing to everyone's holdings of stocks and bonds. This means you do not own your pension. You do not own your IRA. You do not own your 401k. You do not own your own private investments, your own savings in stocks and bonds. You don't own any of that. You have an, an what they call, they call it an entitlement right to use this property until the 
financial intermediary, which holds these financial instruments for you, gets into trouble. The minute that institution, whether it's Merrill Lynch, Schwab, Wells Fargo, the minute they're in trouble, the ownership of all of this passes directly to the creditors of the financial intermediary. So they have done the same thing to stocks and bonds that they had done to money. This is clear. Uh, Webb doesn't just say this. He goes through the regulations. He tells you what they are, quotes from them, what year, which regulatory authority, how, how it happened. Uh, it's quite astonishing that they have, it, it took a long time to create this. And he says it's global, but I think what he means is it's, it's global for all Western countries. So in other words, an American bank that has a bank in Singapore or Hong Kong, it applies to the American bank's assets, no matter where they are. But by global, it doesn't mean that Russia, China, and Iran, or India are part of this network. So the, the uh, great <clears throat> taking of what I call the great dispossession is only going to happen in the Western world. <laughs> All right, Paul, you know, up until now, I mean, that um, you will own nothing to be happy. Now, that's been bandied about for the last uh, couple of years now. And everybody thought you know, conspiracy theory. Uh, at least a lot of people thought that. Now, you've analyzed uh, Webb's book, and uh, you have such a vast financial background and understanding yourself. You find it credible. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's not lying. It's clear. It's clear he's not lying. He He's disturbed at what he's discovered. And he's disturbed that uh, people can't get interested. Uh, you know, it happens, to, it'll, what it'll do to a mega billionaire and reduce him to the same status as a homeless person. It takes his assets. It, it, what it does to the big financial institutions, if they get in trouble, Merrill Lynch gets in trouble, Schwab get in trouble, they cease to exist. And yet, nobody's up saying, hey, what is this stuff dispossessing us? Who wrote these regulations? Why? Because, you see, as we'll talk about if we do a further interview about what the regulatory changes were, it constitutes a taking. It's unconstitutional. And yet, they're, in the, they're written in the regulations. Paul, my next question would be... So, how does an how does an entire regulatory regime that dispossesses us of all of our financial assets, which constitutes a taking, how does that get written into regulations and become law? My next question would be, to what purpose? I mean, if you impoverish the entire Western uh, population, uh, it, you know, what happens then? I mean, you, you have you have no population to exploit after that. If everybody's in poverty, so to what purpose? Well, it's whatever purpose uh, the regulatory agencies or whoever is influencing them intends. And it coincides exactly uh, with what uh, the World Economic Forum has been working for for decades you will own nothing. So it clearly is a method of control. Yeah. It's clearly, it, it means the end of any kind of human independence mm. that is within this system. Now, as I said, there's no indication that any of these regulations could possibly apply to Russia, China, uh, Iran, India, Africa, you know, I, uh, this is a Western thing. And he, as I said, he uses the word global, but he means the global reach of Western institutions. 
But if it's a, if it's an American or a British bank in Singapore, yes, but not Singapore banks. Yeah. Not the banks of Singapore. So uh, you, you're asking a good question. You see, this would uh, this would take. How would you find out? You, you would have to. The Congress would have to go to work. It would have to uh, subpoena people. It would have to uh, bring in the regulators who did it. It would have to bring in uh, Charles Schwab. It'd have to bring in many of the American members. And yet, many of the members of Congress are, are WEF members. Are they going to do that? Right, right. You see? Right. And, and, of course, once they start, uh, the media is going to start immediately saying, witch hunt, witch hunt, witch hunt. Right. And we'll discredit whatever the Congress is trying to bring out. No. Uh, so... In, in a way, and what Webb found was uh, his colleagues, even his partners, they were just interested in making money that day. They didn't want to hear anything to think about other than how can I get my bonus up? And you have to understand in the financial world, that's, that's the motivation. Uh, you make as much money as you can for the firm because they, then your bonus is huge. And so much depends on your bonus and uh, as opposed to a salary. So they don't think about it. And then Webb said he gave one uh, talk to, to a financial group and, and there was just silence. There was no questions, nothing. And then in the social hour afterwards, he asked people, well, what do you think? What do you think? And one guy says, I, I don't care about it. My my clients don't know about it. They don't care. In other words, they're going to continue to the last minute making as much money as they can, even though it's going to be taken away from them. <laughs> right, Paul, wrapping it up now, last question. Uh, how close are we to another financial crisis, another meltdown, major financial crisis, where this would all be enacted and then we're in real deep trouble. I mean, are we on the verge of another big financial crisis? I Webb says so. I address that in part three. So part one, I just address what's happened. You, know, you no longer own what you think you own. Right. Part two, I discuss uh, I give an overview of some of the regulatory changes that accomplished this. And then in part three, I discuss Webb's view that we are on the verge of the biggest financial collapse in world history, much larger than the Great Depression. And that could be close at hand. He says it's close at hand. Okay, Paul, that's that's good for part one. Now, we're going to be doing part two, three, and four as we go along. So uh, thanks for your illustrations of what would be a difficult topic for most people to absorb and uh, pointing out the importance of this book and this apparent discovery of what's really going on. So uh, part two, we're going to be continuing this shortly with part two. This is part one. Part two coming soon, and after that, part three and part four. Paul Craig Roberts, thanks very much for being with us. I enjoy, I enjoy being with you, Larry. Very good program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.